to our 11 a.m. worship service. Let's begin with a call to worship from Psalm 119, verses 105 to 112. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn it and I will confirm it, that I will keep your righteous ordinances. I am exceedingly afflicted. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. O accept the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me your ordinances. My life is continually in my hand, that I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I have not gone astray from your precepts. I have inherited your testimonies forever, for they are the joy of my heart. I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever, even to the end. Amen. Let's pray. Indeed, Lord, your word is a lamp to my feet, and you illuminate the truth so that we will not walk in error and darkness. And Lord, your word gives life and revives us, protects us from the snares of evil. And regardless of how bad the circumstances may be, Lord, we pray never to forget you and your word, that we will uphold them, for they are forever with us. Gracious Father, we thank you for allowing us to have this worship service and pray that it is pleasing and holy to you, that we give you our very best in joy and humility and that we honor you as you should. May this congregation, congregation worship with one heart and one spirit in the unity that you give. This we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. Let's all rise and continue this worship service and lift our, our praises to our Lord. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me who oh, is love. Hey! 
recite the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, on the third day rose from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits on the right hand of God, Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we offer up our worship and praise to you this morning. We bow down before you to confess our sins and repent. Forgive us for falling short of your commands and chasing after the worldly desires. Even though we fail constantly, you are always with us. Thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for keeping your promises to us even when we break ours. We pray that we will be faithful to you and strive to get closer to you every single day. Let us read the scripture daily and pray continuously. May we strengthen in faith and overflow with thanksgiving as we grow spiritually with you. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the leaders. Thank you for our faithful members from the youngest to the oldest. Lord, we pray that this be the church that reverses the trend of this world where people are turning away from you. May this be the church that spreads the gospel unafraid through evangelism and missions. May this be the church that teaches sound doctrine firmly rooted in the scripture. And Lord, may this be the church that glorifies you in all the things that we do. Lord, we pray for our pastoral searches 
We pray that you will provide us with faithful leaders to lead the EM and the elementary ministries. Thank you for all the elders and the deacons who are preaching, teaching, and leading ministries during this time of transition. Give them the wisdom to teach your word. Give them the strength, physically and spiritually, to persevere. Bless them and their families as they serve you with humble and faithful hearts. We thank you and pray for all the lay leaders for their faithfulness and willingness to serve. We pray that this worship of offering will be pleasing to you. May we be fully present here and now as we continue to worship and listen to your word. All this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated for the choir. Thank you again to our choir. Can we please rise for the reading of God's word? John chapter 1, verses 9 to 13. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Amen. Please be seated. A couple of quick announcements that are not in the bulletin. Uh, first, if uh, we will be starting the new membership class again. So if you were part of the last series, uh, please let me know. And if you're interested in the new membership class uh, starting from the beginning, uh, please let me know that as well. Um, and with respect to the pastoral search that Deacon Michael prayed about, uh, it, it is ongoing. And we are working to have guest pastors come uh, occasionally. So if there's a guest pastor, uh, honestly, they may or may not be a potential candidate. So if you see a guest pastor, uh, just act normally and greet them and treat them nicely, just like you would anybody else. Okay, so let's move on to the word. Uh, the message is called The True Children of God. So last week, we went over the close ties between repentance and saving faith and the entry of Jesus as the true light into the world. And we saw the tragic repudiation of the Lord by the world at large and specifically by his own, the nation of Israel. 
With regard to the former point, I went over several examples that reveal the glimpse of the spiritual corruption of the United States, which is symbolic of the decline of Western society as we know it. For those who weren't here last week, I'm sorry that we don't have time to go through those examples again, but you can watch the video. One point I'd made previously to some of you, but I'd like to make clear to the entire congregation is that there are going to be times during these sermons where you might have a very strong disagreement with something that's said. In those cases, I would ask you to prayerfully and patiently consider the issue through the only true and clear lens we have, and that is through scripture. For example, that means if homosexual unions are supported by a political party or a social group, or even places that call themselves churches, that is not the basis for us to judge God's holy word and either twist its clear meaning or deny its clear truth. Let's read Isaiah chapter 5, verses 20 to 21. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. The word woe is an especially emphatic term in the Bible. R.C. Sproul said the following, on the lips of a prophet, the word woe is a pronouncement of doom. In the Bible, cities are doomed, nations are doomed, individuals are doomed, all by uttering the oracle of woe. With that understanding, in verse 20 we read, doomed to those who overturn what God says is good and what he says is evil. Because God is the only one who determines what is good and what is evil. In verse 21, doomed to those who are arrogant and say they know better than God. Those who smugly rest in their conceit. We should take what God says in the Bible and apply it to this world. We do not take something from the world and use that to question God. The supremacy of scripture does not bow or bend to anything we create. No philosophy, no idea, no thought, word, or action can stand up to the true light, to the word himself. And now we pick up at John chapter one, verses 10 through 11. And we complete our understanding of the world's rejection of Israel, of the world's rejection and Israel's personal rejection by his own that Jesus faced. John chapter one, verses 10 through 11. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. Recall two key terms in these verses. In verse 10, when it says, the world did not know him, that's deeper than intellectual knowledge and deals with not having a right relationship with him in closeness and intimacy. In verse 11, his own did not receive him. That refers to those in his own home who have disavowed him from having an intimate relationship. In this gospel, the first 12 chapters deal mainly with those who refuse Christ, while chapters 13 through 21 focus on those who receive him. Now, why did most people in general and in Israel turn their backs on the true light? For that, let's turn to John chapter three, verses 19 to 20. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Verse 19 reveals a stark contrast between the light that has come into the world, who is Jesus, 
as the full expression of God's revelation and the men who love the darkness and their own evil deeds. This is a clear picture of the depravity of man and of our spiritual condition. When faced with the brilliant illumination of the light of Christ, fallen man loved darkness over sin, over the light of righteousness. By doing so, they condemn themselves. Leon Morris states, immersed in wrongdoing, they have no wish to be disturbed. They refuse to be shaken out of their comfortable sinfulness. So they reject the light that comes to them and set their love on darkness. Verse 20 provides more detail of this fallen condition. Now there are two obvious and related qualities of the Lord's enemies, and those are hatred and fear. Everyone who does evil hates the light. Hatred is a powerful term and rightly evokes the most intense response possible from those who are evil. God loved the world enough to send his son as light into the darkness, but the world responds to his love with hatred. Closely tied to their hatred is their fear. The verb for fear implies not only exposure of their status, but shame and rebuke in front of Christ's holiness. The wicked fear the light of truth because it offers them no cover to enjoy their sins. Hypocrisy is exposed, deception is unmasked, and the degenerate are revealed for what they are, those who hate a holy and merciful God. The unregenerate heart refuses to repent and be forgiven. It refuses to confess and to be made clean. This arrogant and stubborn refusal seals their self-incurred condemnation. In the specific case of Israel, their historical recalcitrance was well established in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 65, verses two through three says, I have spread out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in the way which is not good, following their own thoughts, a people who continually provoke me to my face, offering sacrifices in gardens and burning incense on bricks. Here is the heartbreaking image of God constantly spreading out his hands to a people who scorns him. Brothers and sisters, this is the almighty God holding out his hands in loving invitation. We know this well. We spread out our hands before embracing someone we care about, husbands and wives, parents and children, close friends and family. The one who is in a position to give, whether it is love, comfort, or reassurance, that's the one who embraces the one in need to protect them out of concern. And as only God can do, he holds out his hands to redeem to redeem the lost. But the people deny God and follow their own thoughts over his. In fact, as verse three says, they continually provoke him to his face. They follow pagan rituals and worship idols. Such a vile response to God's loving invitation. Unfortunately, their historical rebellion carried over from the Old Testament to the New Testament and peaks after the arrival of Christ. In Luke chapter 19, verses 37 to 38 and 41 to 44, we see Jesus' entry into Jerusalem before his death. 
as soon as he was approaching, near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen, shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known that in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. We see the high and lofty praise given by the crowds, blessing him and proclaiming peace and glory. But instead of receiving their adulation, Jesus weeps over the city. Luke used the strongest Greek term possible for weeping, which shows the depths of our Lord's agony and sorrow over their hard hearts and the hypocrisy of the people he came to save. Some of the people were there only because of spectacular miracles. Others were there because he hoped Jesus would free them from Rome. But Jesus sees the intent of the heart. He saw that most were the same as those who provoked his father, ignoring his outstretched hands of invitation. In a few short days, the crowd that praised Jesus as king would call out for him to be crucified, choosing to free a murderer instead. It's hard to conceive what it would take to cause our Lord to weep in such agony. But one thing is clear, we can have no illusions about the level of our spiritual condition. Forty years after the crucifixion, in 70 AD, Jesus' prophecy would be fulfilled to the letter. That 40-year time is not accidental. 40-year time in the Bible specifically points to that time of trial and testing. Israel did that in the desert. After years of revolts from the Jews that had started in 66 AD, Rome dispatched General Titus Vespasian with four legions and other local allies consisting of over 70,000 soldiers to crush the uprising in Jerusalem. Now here's a painting from the Scottish painter David Roberts from the 19th century depicting the destruction of Jerusalem. The legions first battered down the western gate, then they encircled the city. This prevented those inside from getting additional food and supplies. This led to starvation. Eventually, the Roman soldiers breached the walls and went through the city, plundering and slaughtering over 600,000 Jews, men, women, and children. In August of 70 AD, they destroyed the temple. Let's take a look at the next picture. Stones from the wall of the second temple that were knocked onto the street below by Roman battering rams can still be seen today. Now it's very interesting to note that on the Jewish calendar, the temple was destroyed on the ninth day of the month of Av. In their historical records, the ninth day of the month of Av is the exact day that King Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Solomon's temple in the month of Av in 586 BC. Both temples destroyed on the same day, centuries apart. This cannot be a coincidence. 
Jesus' prophecy had been literally fulfilled. Jerusalem was in total ruin. With the temple destroyed, the entire sacrificial system of worship was destroyed. The remaining survivors were taken as slaves or scattered throughout the Gentile nations. The Jewish state was destroyed. They would not regain statehood again until May 14, 1948. I haven't gone over some of the history of Israel's high points and low points. We in the church might be tempted to look down upon them. We might ask, how could a people with such unique covenants and relationship with God act in such an irreverent manner, generation after generation, and century after century? To the first point, we should not look down on Israel, period, and full stop. And we'll cover why shortly. To the second, the short answer is that it is a key part of God's plan of redemption. God has used Israel to be a source of blessing to all nations because that is the line of the Messiah. But as only God can put together in such a beautiful and wise way, Israel's rejection also led to the blessing of the Gentiles. God always kept a remnant of believing Jews and Gentiles, and there will be a time in the future where spiritual Israel will repent and believe in Christ. Therefore, understanding Israel's role in God's plan is critical for us, both understanding in the past and for the future. Now let's address the first point more carefully here. Romans chapter 15, verse four says, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. The Apostle Paul is referring here to the Old Testament, which establishes the foundation for the great truths of scripture that are fully revealed and completed in the New Testament. It is not old in the sense of being outdated. It provides us essential instruction in the form of doctrine, history, and prophecy so that we can know the truth and guard against erroneous doctrine and ideas. The further application of the Old Testament instruction is that it encourages and gives us strength to persevere in the certainty of godly hope. One clear basis of that hope is the privilege of seeing many prophecies of scripture that have already been fulfilled through Christ. Upon reading the Old Testament, it is clear that we in the church do not stand in a position of moral or spiritual authority above Israel. Of course, we certainly do not condone or support their idolatry or apostasy. But as we'll see, we in the church also have to contend with a host of issues, including idolatry and apostasy. The key idea that we need to steer clear of is something called replacement theology or supersessionism. Replacement theology believes that Israel has been replaced by the Christian church to fulfill the purposes of God, the promises covenants and blessings ascribed to Israel in the Bible have been taken away from the Jews and given to the church, which has superseded them. However, the Jews are subject to the curses found in the Bible as a result of their rejection of Christ. Now even a cursory reading of this, even looking at the last sentence of this, should raise our suspicions. The church is supposed to take all the blessings, but Israel is supposed to take all the curses. This is a dangerous viewpoint 
because it contradicts the clear teaching of scripture. The Abrahamic and Davidic covenants are perpetual and unconditional. The performance of Israel was in no way a condition to God's election of Israel. Let's briefly review the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Now the Lord said to Abram, now Abram was his name before God made him into a great nation. Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land I will show you and I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and so you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Who is the one making the covenant? God is. Who is the one fulfilling the covenant? God is. God says, I will show you the land. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. And I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. God is making and fulfilling the covenant. There is no condition placed on this. There are places in the Bible where God does place conditions. He says, if you obey, then you'll be blessed. If you disobey, you'll be cursed. Those are conditional on performance, but they do not change or nullify this covenant. Now consider, how old was Abraham when God called him? Verse 4 shows he was 75. So what was Abraham's status with respect to God before he was called? Was he the first Jew from birth? For that answer, let's turn to Joshua chapter 24, verse 2. For Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, From ancient times your fathers lived beyond the river, namely, Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. Here's our answer. We see from this that Abraham came from an idol-worshiping family beyond the Euphrates River in Mesopotamia, which is modern-day Iraq. Why then did God choose Abraham? The Bible does not specifically say. But one thing is clear. God does the choosing. Abraham was not the first Jew from birth. Abraham did not seek out God. For the first 74 years of life, he didn't know or worship God. But one day, God called him and provided this incredible covenant. This was the day that God showed Abraham grace. After receiving God's grace, what did Abraham do? We just saw in Genesis 12, 4, he listened to what God said, got up, and left his homeland. Three chapters later, in Genesis 15, Abraham is understandably curious and concerned because he is still childless, and God reassures Abraham in a vision that his descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the heavens. Genesis 15, 6 records Abraham's response. God credited, then he believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. God credited Abraham as righteous because he believed in God. 
That alone was the basis for Abraham's justification and it flowed from the grace that was originally bestowed by God. This point is made clear by Paul in Romans chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. This is the great doctrine of justification by faith alone. Now let's go back to Joshua 24 and look at verses 2 through 5 together as God gives a history lesson to Israel. Joshua said to all the people, thus says the, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, for ancient times your fathers lived beyond the river, namely Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. To Isaac, I gave Jacob and Esau, and to Esau, I gave Mount Seir to possess it. But Jacob and his sons went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt by what I did in its midst. And afterward, I brought you out. What's the key personal pronoun here? I, the great I am. Who is the critical actor here? Of course, it is God. God took Abraham out of his idol worshiping home and led him and multiplied his descendants. God gave Isaac his sons. God sent Moses and Aaron into Egypt to bring Israel out. God's sovereign election and grace are at work. This applies also to the Davidic covenant. When God sent Samuel to Jesse's home to find and anoint the next king, Jesse brought out seven of his sons. Samuel thought it would be the first son, but God rejected him and then he proceeded to reject the next six sons. Samuel then asked if there were any others. Jesse mentioned David, who was tending sheep in the field. Clearly, Jesse, his own father, did not even consider David to be a possibility. But God confounds everyone by choosing David, the youngest of Jesse's eight sons. David did nothing to earn God's favor. And he was not the most likely choice according to the standards of man. But once again, we see that his choice is solely in his domain and for his purposes. In 2 Samuel 7, 12 to 13 and 16, we see the Davidic covenant. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Like the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant is unconditional. Despite some awful and sinful failures in David's life, God will raise up a descendant to David. God will establish his kingdom forever through Christ. This kingdom period is described in Revelation chapter 20 as the 1,000 year period referred to as the millennial kingdom. Afterward, in Revelation chapter 21 and 22, there, the, there will be the eternal kingdom through the new heavens and the new earth that God creates. 
in order to accept replacement theology, one would have to interpret prophecy in strangely metaphorical ways and would have to ignore the clear fulfillment of God's promises in both the Abrahamic and the Davidic covenants. But there's actually a third covenant that would have to be ignored. That is the new covenant in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. It says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. This new covenant is different from the one Israel broke in the wilderness of Sinai. Look in verses 33 to 34 at the similarities to the prior covenants. God says, I will put my law within them and on their hearts. I will be their God, and I will forgive their sin and remember it no more. Once again, God, in his faithfulness and holiness, is the one keeping and performing the requirements of the covenant. Once again, he gives grace to the lost sheep who have gone astray. He remembers their sin no more. At Sinai, God wrote his law on tablets of stone. And those tablets were used by Moses to destroy the golden calf that Israel had made to worship. But in the new covenant, he writes his law directly on living hearts. Hearts of flesh as provided in Ezekiel 36. Replacement theology cannot stand up to the truth of God's word. And as we read Jeremiah 31, 35 to 37, it becomes crystal clear that God has already addressed this unscriptural and faulty idea. Let's read. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day, and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel will cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out below. Then I will also cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. Look carefully at what God is saying. He provides two conditional statements in verses 36 and 37. First, look at 36. If this fixed order departs, then Israel will cease to be a nation before God forever. And what fixed order is he referring to? The one noted in verse 35. The order and working of the celestial bodies, the sun, moon, and stars. Have we taken a look outside at the sky, friends? Anything wrong? 
who made the celestial bodies and who controls them? Of course, it's our Lord, the creator and sovereign king. So if the celestial bodies are thrown out of working order, then and only then, replacement theology might have a chance. Ask ourselves, has this happened? Of course not. How likely is this to happen? Zero. Look at a similar conditional statement in verse 37. If the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out below, then I will cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. How likely is this? Who is going to measure the full range of the awesome work of God in creation? Only the one who made it. No one else. It's plainly evident that God has already rebuked the idea of replacement theology in scripture before people even created it. The Bible says God is the God of Israel more than 200 times. There are more than 2,000 references to Israel in scripture and each one means Israel and it doesn't mean anything other than Israel. When the New Testament refers to Israel over 73 times, it also means Israel. 70% of the Bible is the story of Israel. 100% of the Bible is about Christ, who chose to be born out of the line of Judah. God has not and will not replace Israel. God says what he means, and he means what he says. The covenants we have reviewed today and the way he has treated Israel shows his merciful heart. In fact, the new covenant that we just went over in Jeremiah 31, that was given to Israel at the time they were under divine judgment for apostasy. They were not given when Israel was in obedience to God. They were in fact driven from their land when that covenant was given to them. This is the model of grace that we see throughout redemptive history. From the way he called Abraham to the blessings that we have received through Israel, God is the one who gives abundantly and without measure. He bestowed his grace and mercy to those who preceded us and has used them to bring us into his kingdom as his true children. Let us pray. Gracious Father, the more we understand, the greater and greater our thankfulness our eternal gratefulness to you, Lord, for being the God of grace and mercy. Through your holiness, through your purity, your faithfulness, you make and keep all covenants, even though we fail. And Lord, we are ever thankful that you alone are good and your mercy endures forever. Thank you for those who have come before us, the faithful in Israel, the faithful in the church. And Lord, we pray that we will continue to be faithful to you and to you alone, regardless of what is happening in this world. And that Lord, we embrace you and your light. And we are ever thankful and honored to have the right to become your sons and daughters. This we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Um, we'll have a time of corporate prayer uh, as a response to the message. Let's um, take some time and pray for our true heart of worship to God that we may never take liberty of his truth, uh, of his word. And may we not arrogantly presume that we know more than he does. Let us pray that we will humble ourselves so that we can truly live uh, as his true children of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for keeping promises and your covenants. Thank you for loving us and overcoming the darkness and being the light in this world. We are eternally grateful to you for your grace and mercy. May we live our lives with the heart of obedience and faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, we'll have some, a time of announcements. Uh, welcome everyone to our 11 a.m. service. Uh, we want to especially welcome back um, Pyongyil and Lauren, who got married two weeks ago, and she, they were um, off at another church uh, visiting family, but they're back this week. Can you just let's give them a big round of applause? Thank you. Um, as a reminder, we want to encourage everyone to come to our prayer meetings. Um, so now we have two opportunities for this congregation to participate, one on Wednesday evenings at 8 p.m., uh, that's, that happens weekly, and also uh, Saturday mornings at 6 a.m. So again, we want to uh, continue to, uh, with our lives of prayer, uh, and please join us if you can, if not both of them, at least one of them uh, every week. We are um, starting a choir, a CPC youth choir um, for grades three through 12, and that will begin on Sunday, uh, February 5th. And that the practices will take place uh, 1 to 2 p.m. Um, we are still recruiting the EM choir as well, but you know maybe we have to tap into our younger children since we haven't gotten any responses. But uh, if you are interested, um, Jiyoung Gwonsanyim, who's back in, in the back there, uh, she is gonna be leading uh, the choir practices. So uh, please reach out, there are posters uh, around the building uh, with a QR code on how you can sign up. Um, we're also looking for a guitar teacher, and this is for youth group students who are here at 9.30 a.m. Um, some of the parents and families come early uh, and, and participate, and since there's no youth group service at 9.30, um, we're looking for some activities for them. Uh, and one of the things that we want to do is teach them guitar and possibly help them uh, to be part of the praise team. Uh, so again, Jiyoung uh, Gwansanyim is um, the contact there, so please reach out to her. As we continue to encourage our congregation to read the Bible, uh, our Bible quizzes have gone digital, and you can click, uh, look at the QR code on a weekly basis. And for those who still like paper, we will do paper for the next few weeks, um, but we will transition into more digital format. Um, and in the bulletin, you also receive this uh, insert, which basically is to help you track how you are doing on the Bible reading. We want all of our members to read the Bible at least once, um, completely in a year, but if not, please follow along in our daily Bible reading, which um, is, again, it's maybe five minutes at most a day, so if you can com commit five to ten minutes a day reading and meditating on the scripture, that would be great. 
And for this week, we have our worship ministry um, as our part of a ministry overview. So Deacon Gino, you want to come up? All right, hello, uh, my name is Eugene. You can call me Gino if you want. Uh, and I am currently uh, the leader of the worship team here uh, for the EM. And I just want to I guess uh, talk about what our ministry does, uh, the worship ministry, and what our purpose is. So um, the purpose, worship and praise serves uh, for us is um, one, uh, well, there's four reasons why uh, worship is important. Um, it's one way to uh, prepare our hearts to meet God, a time of intimacy with the Lord, uh, it also introduces who God is to, you know, new believers and people who are interested in, you know, becoming a Christian or just have interest in what Christianity is. And most importantly, it's to glorify God and praise him. Um, and worship is important because it helps us focus on God during our service. Uh, so what does worship at CPC look like? Well, there's... Uh, mainly two types of, uh, of worship, and one is the musical praise, uh, which I'm, you know, I lead uh, most of the time, and there is a choir. Um, musical praise is praise done with, you know, um, you see a lot of instruments, you know, whether it's drums, bass, guitar, you know, our vocals, and we, uh, the songs, song choices that we usually do are um, like contemporary Christian musics. Um, sometimes, I mean, a lot of times now, we'll do, we'll do hymns, and uh, what the choir does and what it is is essentially an ensemble of voices, uh, you know, it, and we sing for the Lord, we sing hymns, um, and with that said, we have three moments of worship in our service. Um, it's first the, the opening praise, and then we do a choir, and then at the end, we do a hymn of response where all together we sing, right? Um, and so, um, what is our goal for the foreseeable future is, uh, I don't know if you guys remember the, the story where Jesus uh, went to Martha and Mary's house, but, um, you know, Martha is someone who, you know, serves and serves and serves, but never takes a break, right? And Mary is there, you know, um, sitting at Jesus' feet, listening and hearing, um, I want to say right now, our priest team is in, in the mentality of Martha, where it's not like we're, um, we're doing it on purpose, but like, you know, every week, all of us that are part of the worship team serve every week, every week, and that's all we do. Uh, but I, my, uh, our goal is to make that Martha mentality into a Mary mentality, where, you know, there'll be some weeks where we serve, and then there'll be some weeks where we take off, but we stay here, we rest in the Lord, you know. Um, and also with that, you know, our goal is to be more flexible with the team. So, for instance, today, uh, I was supposed to be leading worship. My, my, um, the schedule plan was I was going to lead worship, but I got sick. I have a, I have a cough. Um, I have it's not COVID. I tested myself like 10 times, you know. Um, but, you know, thankfully, uh, Deacon Banya came in and stepped in and led worship for us instead, right? Um, and I'm so thankful for that flexibility. But I also want that flexibility for the rest of the team, you know. Um, so what's my ask is if you have a talent in music, whether it's drums, bass, guitar, piano, you can sing. Um, if you can play violin, you know, um, you know, I ask that you would consider, um, serving, um, if you have any conviction, um, you know, please reach out to me, and I just want to say it's not, it doesn't have to be a high commitment thing, like I said, you know, I want us to get to a point where we can serve and also rest, you know, and, uh, maybe it's just once a month, you know, maybe it's one week out of the month where you can serve. That's perfect. You know, that's fine. Um, 
So yeah, if you have the heart and talent, please join us. Thank you. Thank you, Gino. Uh, it, it is important, uh, I think, just to repeat that we worship actually is our, our priority and the offering of worship on Sunday uh, is really the key. So um, we have many of us who come to 9.30 service actually because they serve at 11 o'clock. Um, so we make it mandatory that everyone comes to a Sunday worship uh, if you wanna serve. Uh, and unfortunately, as uh, Gino said, uh, worship team doesn't have that flexibility because they are so limited in terms of membership. So we also want our worship team to be able to worship um, and then also serve as a worship leader. So uh, if you can, you know, if you have a heart or you know, if you want to learn, uh, we can also teach how to play instruments. So please um, consider being part of the worship team. Uh, let us all rise and sing the responsive hymn. <laughs> Close our worship with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, kingdom, and the power and glory forever. Amen. Thank you. Have a great day.